I'm thinking about the hard problem of consciousness, uh, partly in response to, uh, to be serious, Karen Chimera's uh, video on the topic. And uh, I think I'm kind of going through a, a bit of a change of, of, of approach to that, really, or a change of, of feeling toward it. Because uh, as I understand it, and you know, there's probably different understandings on this, the hard problem isn't so much one of, um, isn't a scientific problem, isn't really a necessarily a philosophical problem. Uh, I think Marvin Minsky and indeed Dan Dennett have su su suggested that the, the hard problem in terms of explaining the mechanisms of consciousness, if you like, that may have been already solved. The, uh, the problem isn't one of description necessarily, it might be but it's one of comprehension, what it, what it means to understand something. Because understanding is a felt sense, isn't it? Uh, comprehension, that feeling of getting it, that feeling of things clicking into place, that feeling, that feeling, of, that feeling of knowing, right? And uh, the suggestion is, within the hard problem, the hard problem invites, is that whilst we may be able to describe the processes which produce consciousness, that there's no guarantee that it'll produce that sense of, oh yeah, now I get it. So it'll always feel like a miss, a like a, there's a lack of understanding there. And that's a position that I've kind of been in line with for quite a long time, following people like Colin McGinn, who I think has been labelled as one of the mysterions in that regard. And that's really coming out of a set of thoughts that, you know, the brain and and the mind, consciousness if you like, evolved for particular purposes to solve the problems faced by middle-sized creatures moving at middle speed on a small planet orbiting a class 3 star under this kind of gravity with these kind of sensory organs. The brain has evolved in this environment to solve local contingent problems and um, to give us a feeling of understanding within those circumstances you know, so, you know, the problems of how to get across this cattle grid or the equivalent of it is one that some, an entity like me would, be, would have faced since the dawn of civilization and before. So, so it's a completely understandable problem to me. And I know that all I need to do is walk through this gate that goes along the side and get the satisfaction of having solved that particular problem. I understand the problem uh, because it's... At human scale, I'm fully, I've got a fully embodied relationship to it, and my cognition is is in lockstep with that embodied cognition. So, um, but of course, we didn't evolve to solve problems like quantum mechanics. We didn't evolve to solve problems like consciousness itself, complex, multi-layered systems that are, you know, running well outside of the realm of the senses. That's, uh, I think that's the kind of Mysterion's approach. So for that reason, there will always be problems which, whilst we may be able to solve them in a kind of mathematical sense, where there's no guarantee, as I said, that they'll produce that sense of understanding because it's not doing the thing. The problems aren't the kinds of things which lead to that feeling. So that's that. Um, as I say, I've, I've been in that, I've, I've felt that quite, quite, um, Seriously, for years, I think that's that's been the, that's been the sense that has been most intuitively correct to me. My position is shifting slightly, I suppose, partly in relation to um, something like art and poetry, but also to do with uh, you know different kinds of ways of attacking the problems that the hard problem of consciousness exemplifies, like the, one of the more famous ones, for example. It isn't directly to do with it, but it's related is the, the famous Mary problem that John Searle came up with. You know, you've got this colourblind scientist in a, in a room in which she has access to, to the sum total of, of all knowledge, but no access to direct colour experience. Um, so she finds out everything there is to know about roses, absolutely everything, everything is at her disposal. And uh, the question is, when she steps outside the room, the black and white room, Actually, she's not colour blind, is she? Could be. Anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> she's in a totally black and white environment, looking at the world through a black and white monitor, but has access to every all, all knowledge. When she steps outside the room and sees a rose for the first time, does she experience something new? Does she learn something new? Is there new information gathered from her conscious experience of redness, that quality, as it's called, that is um, unavailable to other kinds of knowing? 
And there's an intuition which says, well, yeah, kind of, yeah, there must be. But there's lots of refutations of that, aren't there? To do with, you know, what, what lurks behind the word knowing in that. Uh, and one of the interesting responses to that, which I think is where I'm going with this right now, was I think made by Dan Dennett in what he called the Robo Mary uh, problem, in which you don't imagine a, color blind, a scientist, a neuroscientist, looking at the world through a black and white monitor in a black and white room. You imagine a, a robot or a, an artificially intelligent agent, a big computer in there. But again, it only has um, sense data, if I can call it that. It only has, um, I don't know, a webcam pointed out into the world that has black and white sensors on it. Come on, peeps. But um, again, it has access to total knowledge um, in some form. And what he suggests, what Dan Dennett suggests in the Robert, Robert Mary example, is that, is that that entity would do what computers do anyway, which is create virtual machines inside itself. You know, if you've got a Mac computer, you can run virtual Windows, or vice versa, you can run virtual Macs, or if you've got a game platform, you can emulate other games within the software of that game. So you can kind of nest virtual machines inside inside one another. And what he suggests is there, Dan Dennett, is that you've got this, you know, really fantastically powerful computer, which of course the experiment demands that you have, which has got access to all this knowledge, then there's nothing to stop the machine constructing a virtual machine inside itself, which does have colour vision. You would be, it would be, it would instantiate the experience of colour vision within the um, within its software, which kind of makes sense. Um, the reason why I think that's kind of like art <laughs> or poetry more broadly, and, and, and I mean that in the broadest sense of course, is that in a sense that's one of the things we do, isn't it? We do construct scenarios inside our heads, you know, even a, a film or a play, you know, it allows us to simulate the experience of other agents inside ourselves. Now of course, with our relatively limited available information, and software, we tend to just simulate the agents which are pretty much like ourselves. So we empathise with characters in soap operas, doing things that we don't ourselves do, but we can kind of imagine ourselves doing. But it's not much of a stretch, is it, to, um, to imagine us being able to simulate the experience of very different kinds of agents, the agents with different sensory networks. And if we had total knowledge, as Mary in the, in the room does, then there's nothing to stop her, in principle at least, if she's got the brain power, running a virtual machine inside herself which has colour vision, or even running a machine inside herself which replicates the sensory engagement with the world that something like a bat has. So, or indeed ourselves. You know, so if, we've, if you can run that kind of experience inside yourself, then you would, and you had total knowledge, and we're able to build virtual machines, virtual representations, simulations of other kinds of entities, like a fantastic Turing machine, in effect, then, um, then yeah, you would be able to replicate not only colour vision, but sound vision, you know, the, the auditory world that a bat lives in, or the olfactory world that a dog like Phoebe lives in. Those would be within your grasp. Um, and as I say, I think that's one of the things that a lot of art does, and poetry does. And indeed, things like maths, although less experientially, it allows you to um, to virtually reproduce completely different experiences that our body doesn't have. So it just uh, it might not extend the limit very far, but it extends the limit of what we are capable of. You know, there's that famous quotation from um, JBS Haldane. You know, the the universe might be queerer than we can suppose, which is in that. That's a kind of Mysterion sentiment, a Colin McGinn sentiment. Consciousness might be queerer than we can suppose. It's just um, beyond the, the grasp of, of human understanding, because human understanding is necessarily constrained by our embodiment. But uh, there's that, that's, that's quite a famous quotation. But we do seem to be able to run virtual machines inside ourselves, which extend that capacity to suppose the unsupposable. Um, you know, whether that be 
using the tools of mathematics to suppose what a quark is, or running the simulations of um, of what somebody in a different gender is, for example, or, some, or even a different animal is to see what their experience is like, or maybe even running the uh, running other kinds of simulations, representations, metaphorical representations, symbolic representations, analogies, abstractions, um, other kinds of relationships, the, the, the tools of art, essentially, um, that, uh, that can do that kind of queer supposing for us. I feel like I'm on a loop, actually. I was talking about queer supposing like four years ago here on YouTube. Never mind. Goes around, comes around. Eh? So, yeah. So, to conclude, I think what I'm saying here is that, um, you know, my position has shifted a bit. I used to be... A, a, pretty much aligned with the Mysterions, that whatever consciousness is, whilst we might be able to, to um, describe it, and may have already done so, the capacity to understand it may be beyond us, because our understanding, our sense of understanding is tied to our biology. My position has shifted a little bit, in that something like poetics, in the broadest sense, the use of metaphor and analogy and abstraction and all of those tools, as encapsulated within art and also some of the sciences, uh, do seem to be allowing us to um, to grasp the ungraspable, you know what I mean? So this consciousness thing, sorry, one last thing. I, I guess I just remember, I used to go to conferences on consciousness a few years ago, and there was always a significant contribution from artists, I guess, which is, you know, what I was doing there, because I'm clearly not a scientist in that sense. Um, and it was taken very seriously, the contribution by artists and writers and poets, musicians. Because the um, because it's recognised that somewhere between the first person perspective of um, of being alive and awake and seeing the colour green and having all that qualia experience, between that, which is totally unavailable to science, and the third person view of science, there's this area in between second person perspective I guess or something like that which is uh, between the between the two and which perhaps can act as a as a convey a conveyance to, to allow these things to to talk to one another and that's essentially the realm in which something like art operates somewhere between the personal and the impersonal between the the singular and the subjective and the uh, multiple the plural and the objective between the highly um, unique and idiosyncratic and the uh, material and impersonal and intersubjective. Anyway, yes, that'll do for that, I think. Quite cold here today, but at least it's not windy and rainy as it has been here in Cornwall for the last week. Thank you.